I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Squamish, and uh, Musqueam people. Um, my name is Ian Angus. I've been I'm associated with the Institute for the Humanities, and have been for about the last 20 years or so. Um, this well, I'm glad to see you all here tonight. I'm sure it'll be an interesting lecture. Um, it's a particular pleasure. To me, for me to introduce uh, William Leese tonight, because many years ago, in fact, not quite, but very nearly a half century, um, he was my dissertation supervisor. And I think if I... Re years? <laughs> well, not when I finished, but pretty much when I started. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I think I was the first. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to introduce him tonight. Bill has a long-standing uh, 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 connection to Simon Fraser University. He was chair of the communication department in uh, the 1980s for six years, and uh, after that, vice president research. After he left SFU, he had held the eco-research chair in environmental policy at Queen's University the NSERC, SHRC, and Industry Chair in Risk Communication and Public Policy at the University of Calgary, and has worked in the McLaughlin Center for Population Health Risk Assessment at the University of Ottawa. He's uh, a fellow and past president of the Royal Society of Canada and, uh, and an officer of the Order of Canada. He wrote an important early book, uh, the, the <laughs> early for Bill, that is to say, not early in history, uh, uh, The Domination of Nature, which was a widely influential book that uh, uh, helped uh, people involved with the Frankfurt School move towards ecological and environmental issues. After that, published The Limits to Satisfaction and Social Communication in Advertising. Later was a founder of the field of risk communication and has got about four books or so, many studies in that area and is most recently author of a work of utopian fiction, a three-volume work called Hera Saga. And I haven't even mentioned everything. Uh, William Leese is a bold and prolific thinker, and I'm uh, glad to introduce him to you tonight to speak on the threat of, or threats of superintelligence. Thank you, Ian. I told him last night that um, it's quite alarming when your students retire. <laughs> uh, you understand what I mean. Um, and he forgot to mention uh, in going over my biography and my connection to Simon Fraser University that um, I was fired as vice president of research. <clears throat> It's also um, a pleasure to have Richard Smith here, one of my oldest and closest colleagues for many, many years. And to some extent, to the extent that if I, I have any legacy to leave, it's Ian and Richard who represent that um, in Canada. That may or may not be an honor for them. Uh, they'll have to figure that out. I'm, uh, I'm only going to show uh, a few slides, not the whole presentation. I, I, re I really like giving a lecture for people to look at me rather than try to decipher the screen. But you can get um, a copy of the entire PowerPoint presentation, which is the text of the lecture, either from me or from the Institute of Humanities. So, and there are a number of, of embedded URLs in the PowerPoint, which will take you to other, some really interesting sites that I have used in this presentation. So uh, I think uh, for some reason these few front slides got mixed up, so I don't know what's going to come up. OK, that's the, uh, that's the second book of the trilogy um, with a title from a letter, from a sentence in a letter to, written by Albert Einstein. And you know, as an author of a fair number of books, you have your own favorites. Uh, this is one of my favorites. The, uh, Cover artwork is the famous painting by Alex Colville, Horse and Train. Uh, that's the first one. That's Colville's Church and Horse. And the last one, 
Colville's Moon and Cow, one of my very favorite paintings. Um, and you'll find in that book, which is an e-book only on Amazon, really cheap. Um, and the nice thing about e-books, I started this last year with Richard's help, you can put all kinds of nice color pictures in them. And it makes such a much more interesting text. So anyway, um, I have a longer uh, section uh, on the threat of superintelligence, a whole chapter there, followed by a short story called Good Robot, chapter eight. In chapter eight, I have a dialogue between my main character, Hera, and a supercomputer, which speaks very good English. Um, but that's set about 50 years in the future. By then, that'll not be a pro it's not a problem now. You can talk to Watson, IBM's Watson, uh, which has mastered natural language. Um, the, title, the title of that chapter is uh, stolen from one of the most famous books in history, Galileo, Galileo from the 16th century, Dialogues, concer in Ga Dialogues Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, and of course Galileo, who was um, put under house arrest by the Inquisition uh, for that book. It was the two, di the two world systems are the heliocentric um, and the geocentric version of, uh, of the solar system. And I have transformed it into two chief life forms, silicon and carbon. So those are the ads, which you always have to see when you go to the movies these days. <laughs> and it is, this is the book that it's about. 2014, Oxford University Press. I was sort of bowled over when, I, when Richard uh, told me about this book. And this is a book that's had an amazing influence after 2014. He raises questions, as you'll see, about like whether a, a super intelligent machine would want to get rid of us. You might think that's odd, but you wouldn't think it's odd after you read his book. Um, and it is so good, it's been so influential that in the years after he published it, a whole bunch of people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates um, has, have put money into something called AI safety. And if you Google that term, you'll see a whole bunch of university research institutes which are now devoted to trying to make artificial intelligence safe. Uh, they, Gates and Musk took it seriously enough to put at least $10 million each into it. Stephen Hawking called attention to it sometime before he died. Um, so th th it's an amazing impact. There are now probably more than a dozen university-based research centers devoted to AI safety. OK, so what is superintelligence? Here's the definition from Bostrom's book. An intellect that is much smarter than the best human brains in practically every field, including scientific creativity, general wisdom, and social skills. That is a superintelligent entity. Of course, we also are referring to, they call it artificial intelligence. I, I prefer machine intelligence. We're referring to a machine, a computer, obviously. But. And this has been written about for some time before Bostrom's book about the possibility that such an entity as a super intelligent machine could emerge for some years before. And some, some people have used the term the singularity. It's just, you know, it, they've, they've taken this from a much more serious uh, use of the term singularity, which is the Big Bang, the start of the cosmos. So they've taken it, but they've taken this to mean the point at which such a machine comes into being, the singularity. And a lot of them think it's a really good thing and they can't wait till it happens. So we'll have to see what we think about that. Because what Bostrom asks immediately about such an entity is what he calls a control problem. We will create it, but will we always control it if it's so much smarter than we are? Uh, on, 
a machine has a kill, kill switch, you can, you can turn off your computer. Will the, kill, will the kill switch always work? Or can it be bypassed? Will the machine want to control itself? <clears throat> More to the point, will it want to control us? And even more to the point, will it want to deceive us about its wish to control us? <laughs> That's even more interesting. These are all themes in Bostrom's book. Will it have what Bostrom calls clandestine goals? In other words, its own goals hidden from us. And in the end, will it just want to do away with us because we've become superfluous? And Bostrom considers all those questions. Now, why, what, why it is such a thing even conceivable? And mostly it's a question of processing speed. Uh, once you get to a certain level of general performance, and now computers work at the speed of, uh, I think it's one petaflop a second, something like that, it's enormously fast. Electronic circuits operate at a speed just below the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. Our pathetic biological brains, which also work as an electrical system, operate at 120 meters per second. That's a lot faster. So, but the first question you will want to ask is, why are we doing this? Why would anybody want to do this and raise those possibilities? Well, there's a very nice article that explains that called The Singularity from 2010. Um, and this is a quotation from it. And I'm going to read this a couple times because it'll tell you really what the theme of this talk is all about. If there is a singularity, Chalmers says, it will be one of the most important events in the history of the planet. An intelligence explosion has enormous potential benefits. A cure for all known diseases, an end to poverty, extraordinary scientific advances, and much more. Then he says, it also has enormous potential dangers. An end to the human race, an arms race of warring machines, the power to destroy the planet. So I read this and thought to myself, I know that language. I don't know anything really about artificial intelligence except what I can read in science magazines that explain it to me in language I can understand. But one of the reasons I was so much taken by Bostrom's book is that he used the language of risk. And I've been working in that for 30 years and I've written a whole bunch of books in it. And risk is risk. It doesn't matter what the danger is. You only ask ever two questions about a risk. What's the probability or likelihood that it will happen? And if it happens, how bad will it be? That's every risk can be categorized in those two simple terms. So R equals P plus C. Risk equals probability plus consequences. And it goes, every health issue that we have goes through that. Uh, every economic issue because we learned in 2008 in the financial collapse that the people who invented risk management didn't know how to manage it. I wrote a whole book about that because I'm trying to figure out. I mean, this was, risk management was, was invented in the insurance and banking industry. R equals P plus C. And in a sense, all of us know this, um, and we know what are called trade-offs between the threat that some things produce, uh, and the benefits. Every time we take a prescription drug, we're involved in risk-benefit trade-offs. Um, the benefits are, are, we hope, obvious to us. It's why we take it in the first place. But every drug has a side effect risk. In fact, if you're obsessive about things and read about the side effect risk, you wouldn't take any of them. But you have to understand, you have to look at the probability of the bad things happening. And many of those probabilities are extremely low. And you're still well, much better off taking the medication. But that's, that's the general framework. When we deal with risk, we, we incur risks only because we anticipate benefits. Why else would you do it? 
because rich risks are um, the things that can harm us. And then we look at the trade-off. Do the benefits exceed the risks, and do they exceed by a substantial amount? And everything we do is a risk-benefit trade-off. I mean, I'm a notorious jaywalker. Every time I do that, I'm engaged in a risk-benefit trade-off. I don't have to walk to the corner. I have a, a risk that's calculated statistically very accurately of how likely it is I will be hit by a car because there's a lot of data on that. Everything we do. Now let's look at the Chalmers quote again. A singularity is an intelligence explosion that has enormous potential benefits, and he lists them, cure for all known diseases, etc. It also has enormous potential dangers, and into the human race and the power to destroy the planet. So I asked myself, what person in his or her right mind would be willing to to get those benefits for incurring those risks. It's simply nuts. An end to all known diseases. OK, you know, we, a lot, we've come a long way in the control of disease since 1900, which is a point at which, after which uh, you had an incremental benefit from getting medical attention. Before then, you were worse off. <laughs> you know, you've, you've heard of bleeding and other things. But since 1900, there's been enormous progress. And so in those societies which have the resources to fund advanced health cares, healthcare, there, I mean, it's like night and day uh, between this and even the, uh, the 19th century. Most of the advances actually are in public health, just clean water and sewage treatment. That's the main. <laughs> but after that, you know, even in, in our lifetimes, our recent lifetimes, there have been enormous advances and treatments for cancer. Really bad things like childhood leukemia and so on. Enormous advances just in the last 20 years. So we know about this. So the idea of a cure for known diseases, well, we're on that path, having nothing to do with superintelligence. Would you trade that for an end to the human race and a power to destroy the planet? This is not something to myself. Somebody wrote this. <laughs> Completely nuts. But that doesn't stop the fact you can find proponents of superintelligence all over the internet. People who, you know, programming actually doing this stuff. They can't wait for it to happen. They, there's a whole bunch of projections. How soon will it come? You know, 40 years, 50 years, maybe sooner? And they get all excited. Well, here's a nice warning from a man named Elizir Yudkowsky. He's a frequent collaborator with Bostrom. He's co-founder of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in Berkeley, which is a private nonprofit. And in, in an odd uh, place, uh, the magazine Vanity Fair, which is actually a very good magazine, uh, Yudkowsky was inter and others like him were, inter um, were interviewed by my favorite New York Times columnist, Maureen Dowd, um, in 2016. And Yudkowsky told her, and this is a quote, if you're going to build a machine that's smarter than you are, you'd better get it right the first time. <laughs> Very nice, huh? That sounds good. But just how are we going to make sure that whoever builds such a machine keeps that warning in mind? There's no general oversight to all this stuff. Artificial intelligence, which is the normal word, phrase that's used, is growing, I'll give you many examples, by leaps and bounds at an accelerating pace. Who's going to stop it? Especially if it's a rogue state. But even so, even in a country in North America, there are lots of people who are thinking, they can't wait until this happens. Are they going to read Yudkowsky's warning? OK. So we have a dilemma here in this risk-benefit trade-off, a serious dilemma. So how should we approach it? I'm certainly no genius like Gudkowski, who, by the way, never finished high school. I have no, really no good idea as to how machine intelligence operates. I confess that right off the bat. Maybe it has something to do with writing computer code. I don't know. But what about most of you? I mean, this is the Institute of Humanities, after all. I came up through that tradition. I studied Hegel's logic in my PhD program. You think that would help? 
Probably not. But I'd like to suggest to you tonight that we're, let's look to try to find a way for us ordinary folks to understand what's going on here. In other words, not to use the machine, uh, the kind of machine language you will find, which is mo are mostly very technical algorithms, but just ordinary language. So I'm going to cover the following things which are relevant to the, uh, the growth of machine intelligence. First, something we all know, evolution and natural selection, because you can find a literature now on digital evolution. And what they claim is it mimics biological evolution. I'll tell you why in a couple of minutes. Evolution and natural selection. The other thing we need to understand is what are simulations? The uh, synonyms for simulation are um, just copy or emulation. Games are simulations. That's the best way to explain it. Games are simulations. It's a pretend, you know, you, you pretend that you're shooting 100,000 people down, something like that, and getting a nice reward. We also have to understand a little bit about what algorithms are. The algorithms are sets of rules. This is the fundamental part of machine intelligence. The technical definition, an algorithm is a formal set of unambiguous instructions that is executed in a prescribed order. So do this, then do that, then do that, then do that. That's pretty simple, but that the fundamental basis of computer intelligence is writing algorithms that says do this, then do that, then do that, then do that. Other things are quite simple. We, we need to uh, look at trial and error learning. Well, we all know what that is, and that's what humans use to learn. But then there's a concept which you need to understand called deep learning. And I'll talk, tell you what that is. There's also something you need to understand called neural networks. Um, our brain is a neural network. And what they've done is simulate that in the computer. What it means is that the, the fundamental attribute of our brain for the purpose of learning is the sheer amount of neurons we have and their interconnections. We have 100 billion neurons in the brain. There are other brain cells, glial cells, but in addition, 100 billion neurons. And the connectivity between them is estimated at 100 trillion because they're, they're connected mul to multiple ways. 100 trillion. And every time we try to remember something, a path is created through that connectome, which is what it's called. Some, some path with a beginning and end. And if we were to you know, study for exam and try to keep you know, so repeating to ourselves the same formula, because we needed to remember that formula, the neurons um, get weighted by that repeated. Thing. And so that's why you have, mem when you have good memories, you have a good memory because a track has been laid down which you can access. And it's, and it's stable because you've, it's been laid down over and over again. Other thing, if it's only once, maybe it's um, <clears throat> not laid down. And because, in fact, uh, when you sleep, the brain is, uh, which is never off, by the way, never off, is poking around saying, well, what can we get rid of here? There's a lot of trash <laughs> in here. And it, what do it's pruning all the time. But if you've got these things that you've tried hard to remember, those things are stable. They won't be pruned. Neural networks. And I'm going to talk to you about Deep Blue and Deep Mind. So let's start with simulation. I've already said basically, simulation is a key concept in self-learning. Uh, and bundled on the brain, um, we, we basically use that in order to um, work through certain problems. And computer engineers have simulated that process in a machine. So what, with respect to machine intelligence, it actually wasn't making much progress. And it, it's, it was first suggested in the 1950s in a, in a path-breaking article. Um, uh, but it really didn't make much progress until experts figured out 
that the way to make progress is to try to emulate the human brain. The way the human brain works and how the brain learns. And then there was a huge breakthrough. Um, first of all, the neural nets. So they simulate that in the computer. Uh, you want dense interconnectivity between the nodes in your system. And we have a brain that, uh, that not only can learn, but it has a process of self-learning. Our, our brain, I mean, we learn as children even before we're aware of ourselves, and the brain is learning all the time. It is, it is, a, it is an organism that's made to learn. And I said, well, we can do that. So I've explained the neural networks, deep learning. Deep learning means um, normally you would give a computer a specific objective. Um, do this, calculate x, y, z. Um, calculate uh, the stress load in a building, whatever. But deep learning is unstructured. You don't give an objective. You just give the machine simple rules and say, go. I'll come back to go in a minute. And they made great progress. Uh, in 2007, I think it was, IBM gave a team the task of creating a machine that could beat the best contestants in the world at Jeopardy. This was Watson. Um, named for the founder of IBM. In 2010, they were ready, three years. 2011, they held a competition. Watson beat the two highest scoring players ever to win at Jeopardy. This was broadcast. I didn't see it, but it, it was broadcast. You probably can still find it on the web. Three years it took them. But it's also now widely used. I was Googling it today. Watson, deep learning, uh, empathy. Um, and that you, you can run a trial for yourself. Well, we said, well, what does it do? Why, is, why are businesses now buying it? Well, if you think of what's been going on with Facebook, here's one of the, one of, only one of the main reasons why. It will offer you, and you can try all these things at no cost, and then if you want to proceed it, then you've got to pay. One of the things it tells you it can do, if you'd like to do this, is take a piece of text, a Facebook post, and it will decode the personality trace, traits of the person who wrote it. Now, that resonates with what's happening right now with Facebook, because that was used um, by political actors for nefarious ends. But what's, it's right there on the page. So if, if you'd like to do this, it'll help you do it. So some of you may want to try it. OK, the second thing is what I, that we have to cover, and I told you about, is uh, natural selection, that is evolution and randomness. In a some sense, evolution in nature, um, and we are the products of that uh, process, is simply based on having enough time. As long as you have variability, which we have in our genome, because every time a cell, a cell replicates, and we have billions of cells in each of our body, every time a cell replicates, because the old one is worn out and needs a new one, it has to copy the genome. Three billion base pairs, an incredibly long single molecule. I think it's like, it could be seven feet long or something, because, but it's all nicely folded up in a package. Every time any cell replicates, uh, it has to copy uh, the genome, three billion base pairs. Mistakes are made. You know, something, sometimes even uh, being, uh, you know, a pulse of radioactivity. And, and we are, I mean, there's a, a constant shower of low-level radioactivity on the Earth. Uh, but that would go right through our bodies. And if it hits a genome on a particular base pair, you know, the ACGT, um, you get an error. 
So you need, what you need for evolution uh, is variability. And, and then fitness will come automatically. That is, if there's a change, and that change is a good one with respect to the persistence of the organism, that one will win. All you need is variability. Um, and on en enough time and simple random effects. All these changes in DNA which ref lead to genomic variability um, and happening all the time, they're happening randomly uh, depending on what part of the genome has been miscopied. But some of these things, some of these things um, make the organism worse off and they would tend to die out. The ones that improve fitness will um, be preserved through reprodu reproduction and will be conserved then in, in the genome and we will have it for either forever or for a very long time. And basically what Mother Nature is doing is running a trial and error experiment. Well, let's see this, see that. You know, remember um, some time ago when uh, there was still a, a, a pre at least a phony debate between uh, bi biologists and creationists. And uh, the creationists thought they had a trump card to play. No way by random change could you get a, some, an, an organ as complex as the eye. Well, bullshit, of course you can. It's take enough time. You know, it starts with simply the, the ability of a cell to sense the difference between light and dark. And it goes on from there. And ultimately, you get the eye. Just trial and error and enough time and a mechanism for variability, which in our case is the genome. But remember the, computer, remember the speed at which the computer works. Well, you can now read, there's the literature. I just read a long article that Richard found on digital evolution. What that means is, that the, and they say in the article, this is an, a direct analogy with biological evolution. That machine intelligence with deep learning capabilities can self-evolve. Based on, for most of them, based on its objective, in other words, it's given, a, it's given a, an objective and said, uh, get the outcome that's the best solution for that problem. It can self, and this article, um, and if you're interested, Richard has the URL, I do now too. This article basically gives a whole bunch of examples of how uh, a problem was set and the computer was set, was set run, run the task of finding the best solution for a particular objective and it found a different one. And in some cases, it was a better one. Better than the people had thought of. So, digital evolution means uh, machine intelligence with deep learning capabilities the capability to self-evolve. Okay, what do we mean by deep learning? And here's a lovely example uh, based on an article in the MIT Technology Review from last year. In 2015, a research group at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York was inspired to apply deep learning to the hospital's vast database of patient records. The data set featured hundreds of variables on each patient. And remember, there are 700,000 patients. Starting with the patient comes in, certain complaints, certain symptoms, the doc, so that's stage one, stage two. Uh, a doctor, certainly in the US, will order a whole bunch of tests because that's what they do, whether they're needed or not. So then you have test results. And then maybe you have some additional back and forth, but eventually you get a diagnosis. And with the diagnosis, then treatment options are offered, and the final stage is outcomes. How well did that work, or did the treatment kill the patient? Um, so you have that series of steps, and all of that are, each one of those series of steps are in the 700,000 records. The resultant program was named by the researchers Deep Patient. When tested 
on new records, it proved incredibly good at predicting disease. In fact, on the whole, it was more probable that the machine was right rather than the doctor. On the, on the um, predicting the disease. At the same time, deep patient is a bit puzzling. It appears to anticipate the onset of psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia exceedingly well. And schizophrenia is very difficult for ordinary human doctors to predict. So it does much better on those kind of things. But then the, um, the people who created deep patient said, well, how does it do that? So they go and look in the routines that were run. And the researcher told this reporter, he still doesn't know. The new tool offers no clue as to how it did that. He could not figure out how the machine had done so well. We can build these models, he says ruefully, but we don't know how they work. Now, should we be worried about this? Well, some of you may know, some of you may not know, and this is especially true of the US. Such predictive models are already being used to determine who makes parole, who's approved for a loan, who gets hired for a job, and in the military, how to select targets. It's already in use. Now, um, the problem is you can't explain. So in the case of parole, that's based on something I know really well, based on a risk assessment. How likely is it that this person will reoffend, And if he or she reoffends, how serious an offense might it be? And so this is a probabilistic thing, ideal for the computer to work on. Throw in a whole bunch of data, right, about outcomes from parole. You have loads of data. And then the guy goes before the judge, and the judge says, parole denied. And neither the judge nor the district attorney would be able to explain why that decision was made. But they're using it. But, and those models will get better and better, partly through self-evolution, partly by adding more features to it. And the human miners will not be. The EU, which unlike the USA, still takes regulation seriously, is now, right now, trying to figure out how to require private firms, private firms which use these models, to explain how they operate. But according to this article by night, they won't be able to do so. And here, one of the best commentators of all on these type of things, a philosopher named Daniel Dennett, and said in response to that, if it can't do better than us at explaining what it's doing, then don't trust it. <laughs> like Yudkowsky, a wise man. OK, now let's get into the, the most fun stuff of all, starting with Deep Blue and going on to AlphaGo. You probably all know Deep Blue, because it beat Gary Kasparov at chess, right? Um, and how to do that? Well, chess is based on specific rules, as those of you know. But every single piece can only move in certain ways. So it's quite limited in that respect. So although the total number of moves is very large, still, it's not unlimited. And the computer in this deep blue, in this case, was using basically its speed of operation. Because a chess grandmaster plays well by anticipating moves five, six, seven moves in ahead. A computer can do that much faster. And it can do it much more variables, speculate on much more, many more moves and counter moves. And that's how Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. Now, there's AlphaGo. Anybody you ever have heard of AlphaGo? Yeah. The game of Go is the oldest game in the world, 2,500 years old. It's played on a board 19 by 19. 
with only two types of places, white stones and black stones, two types of pieces. The objective is to, for one set of pieces, surround the others so it has basically no moves less, or in such a way that as you do with um, resigning in chess, you know that if you're not, it's not over yet, but you can't win. Google has a subsidiary in London called DeepMind, uh, which works with self-learning algorithms. Basically, this is trial and error. It's very simple, actually. They, uh, they said they were going to try to do what Deep Blue had done with chess with Go, and everybody said, oh, you can't do that. I mean, um, the number of moves in Go is practically infinite. So you can't you can't do that. Well, so what they do? They set up they set up um, a machine with self-learning algorithms, and they inputted the rules of the game, which are quite simple. You can move one space at a time, really. After the initial placement uh, of stones on the board, and then they fed the system with three hundred thousand completed games played by humans, and they set their game engine uh, to learn from the human games. And so then they took it to a competition with, with a world champion, South Korea's Lee Sido. And all the master of the game are sitting around watching the screen. Five game match, AlphaGo won four to one. And I liked especially a couple of the, at, in game two, move 37, which AlphaGo won, a, a move was made on move 37, which elicited a gasp in the human audience. They said, it was so beautiful. It was so unique. I love that. But, uh, to be sure, in game four, which is the only one that uh, Seedol won, he made a move of similar creativity. So in effect, he and the machine were learning from each other. That's really nice. OK, but they didn't, but DeepMind didn't stop there. They um, developed an improved version, AlphaGo Master, and set it up to play against the world's top ranked human player, China's KG. And the machine beat him three to nothing. It gets better. Then they worked Alpha, AlphaGo Zero. They fit into AlphaGo Zero only the rules of the game and nothing else. And then they set it to play against the preceding version called AlphaGo Master. Had to learn all by itself, had no other input except the rules of the game. Eventually it beat the earlier game by a score of 100 to nothing. It was what we call tabula rasa, blank slate, just the rules. And playing against, but you know, playing against, well, how fast? I mean, you're playing by this supercomputer. You're playing games probably within milliseconds, over and over and over. There's no, in a sense, there's almost no mystery to this. Give it the speed, give it a task, give it, uh, in this case, a competitor and say, go. This is, this is really something. Well, we, we've talked about um, this all starts with the simulation of the human brain. Basically, deep learning, self-learning, neural networks um, that basically emulated how the brain learns and put it in the machine. And then they had, of course, a, the vast great power of the machine in terms of the speed of operations. But what, here's an, uh, an example of how this works on a very mundane level. What if you were a quadriplegic and there's nothing more in the world you wanted than to walk again, um, but basically you have a severed spinal cord, so that's not going to happen. Well, at Duke University, there was a guy who dedicated to trying to make that happen. 
In other words, he wanted to see whether if you fit such a person with a harness, metal and straps, with motors on it, and the person thought about walking, he could walk. Not likely, right? So they started with monkeys, macaque monkeys. And what they did was implant very fine electrodes, actually 300 of them, in the motor cortex of the monkey. And then they recorded, I mean, the, the neurons fire. It fires by giving off an electrical charge that can be captured in a consumer, in a, in a computer program. As a pat, if I go like this, two things happen. First of all, we now know that my mind anticipates that movement two milliseconds before I do it. And the, so the neurons are ready. But when I do this, a certain set of neurons fire. If I were to do this, a different set would fire, and this, a different set. <laughs> but they, captured, they can capture all of that in the computer program. And so basically, the, I'll make a, it's a long story. This is over 10 years of work. Uh, eventually, what they succeeded in doing was so the, mon the monkey sitting there, and the monkeys work for grapes. They love grapes. There's a beautiful scientific article in which two monkeys are placed side by side, and they're asked to do tasks, which they like to do. And one of them is rewarded with vegetables, and the other with grapes. The first might go berserk, screams and yells, because he sees the grapes, and they love grapes. So they give these monkeys grapes. They got to the point where the monkey is sitting there, he's got the electrodes uh, wired up, and he's looking at a screen. The screen has the avatar of the monkey on it. And the monkey learns to move the arm of the avatar just by thinking about it. Nice, huh? Very, very nice. Very nice. The basic reason they can capture that, those signals in a, in a useful form, is that our mind, and the monkey's mind as well, has a special type of neuron called mirror neurons. It's all based on that. These neurons, the same neurons or pattern of neurons light up when, when I go like that or when I watch you doing that. The same neurons fire. That's why they could do that kind of thing. So I'll see if I can find this. Yeah. They hooked up, they had the monkey in the North Carolina lab and they had him on a treadmill. And they hooked up in real time their lab with a lab in Japan, which had a robot on a treadmill. So I'll read, I'll read you the text, which is a st step one. A 12-pound monkey named Hidoya was trained to walk upright on a treadmill. Electrodes implanted in her brain monitor the activity of 250 to 300 neurons. The brain signals were processed and used to predict the monkey's leg movements with a 90% accuracy. The monkey then watched the robot over a video link and was rewarded when she made the robot walk. So it's the same thing as the, the limb on her avatar. After an hour, the monkey's treadmill was switched off, but her brain continued to control the robot, which continued walking. The monkey controlled the robot's walking on the treadmill. This friggin' amazing. I love science for that. <laughs> well, what's he doing? He wanted to do what I said to do. Can I get a human with severe nerve damage fitted with an apparatus to walk just by thinking about it? So they're getting there. That's good. <coughs> now, what does um, Bostrom and others have to say about malicious? machine intelligence. <clears throat> there, um, Bostrom works in an outfit, <coughs> very fine outfit called the Future Humanity Institute at Oxford. <coughs> and they have a report called The Malicious Use of Artificial Intelligence, published in February of this year. On the um, slides, I have the URL 
and go get the report. The malicious use of artificial intelligence. A couple quotes from that. It has often been the case that once AI systems reach human level performance at a given task, such as chess, they then go on to exceed the performance of even the most talented humans, as a general rule. Nearly all AI researchers in one survey expect that AI systems will eventually reach and then exceed human level performance at all tasks surveyed. Most believe this transition is more likely than not to occur within the next 50 years. It's also linked to uh, robotics because they, um, they now have begun to implant uh, AI systems in robotic intelligence. Um, if you want to see a really cute one, you can Google Pepper. Pepper is a, is a human assistance robot developed by SoftBank in Japan. Uh, and they're starting to, they've just made a deal with Watson with IBM to use Watson um, in, <clears throat> in Pepper's brain. Interesting enough, Pepper, from, from the fact that I've been preoccupied with uh, empathy for a long time, the title of the first of my book, Hero or Empathy, they, they, pro, they have programmed Pepper with, a, with an empathy module. Because Pepper is designed to be a personal care assistant in a home for an older person or something like that. And so they're working very hard at the, the human-robot interface. Richard Center had an interesting talk by a researcher from Calgary, an Israeli, who was um, working on that kind of stuff yesterday. Given that intelligent systems can be deployed for a range of goals, Highly capable systems that require little expertise to develop or deploy may eventually be given new dangerous goals by hacking them or developing them de novo. We may, we may see that says powerful AI systems with a property that says just add your own goals. <laughs> there are cr also cross-cutting issues stemming from the intersection of cybersecurity and increasingly autonomous cyber physical systems. The diffusion of robots to a large number of human occupied spaces makes them potentially vulnerable to remote manipulation for physical harm, as with, for example, a service robot hacked from afar to carry out an attack indoors. Okay, well, let's, let's leap ahead now and look in the future. We have, or are close to having, we're close to the singularity. Because this, this work is, is accelerating by leaps and bounds. The speed of new developments, one can hardly keep up even if you just read, like me, the general magazines. So we would ask ourselves, well, what, so with respect to such a machine, what does it want? We have all the components in place, and we know that such, a, such an entity can evolve, digital evolution all on its own. Once it's set up with the right resources and the human overseer says go, it just goes. And as long as it's not switched off, it continues to go. Just like a cellular organism in biological evolution. And to summarize, the key components are self-learning alg algorithms, simulation, trial and error, that means recursive, over and over and over and over and over. And then you, you link uh, data banks that store information to the machine. I mean, Watson does that right now. Watson had that done to, to beat the Jeopardy, uh, other Jeopardy contestants. They loaded it with a data bank of uh, information like whole dictionaries and other things like that. Um, and they also actually ran practice sessions with Watson to improve its performance. Data banks that store information, uh, Watson now has access through the cloud to immense data banks, just immense. And then specify objectives, choose tell, and tell the uh, machine, the, choose the most efficient route to realize the objective. For, for example, AlphaGo was, this is exactly how AlphaGo was programmed. 
AlphaGo was programmed with the objective of achieving the maximum probability of winning against an opponent. That's all they did. The maximum probability of winning against an opponent. That's all they needed to do to set in motion this development. And then, having learned from, in the first iteration of Alpha, the human games, it just was set as it was in AlphaGo Zero, just playing against itself at incredible speed. That's all. It's pretty simple, actually, when you come right down to it. So, well, what, what could happen? Well, Nick Bostrom, in a much earlier paper in 2003, wrote what I call the paper clip caper. And this is a quote. Suppose we have an AI whose only goal is to make as many paper clips as possible. The AI will realize quickly that it would be much better if there were no humans, because humans might decide to switch it off. Because if it switched it off, there would be fewer paper clips. Also, human bodies contain a lot of atoms that could be made into paper clips. <laughs> the future that the AI would be trying to gear towards would be one in which there were a lot of paper clips, but no humans. So if we look at it from a distance, we say, oh, well, what, what would such an entity need to have in order to do that kind of thing? Well, it would need a constant source of electricity. But maybe it would just plug itself into the internet where, where you have control systems for electrical generating stations running, control programs. A constant source of electricity it needs and no on-off switch or an on-off switch that has surreptitiously been made inoperable. It needs a connection to the internet and it needs an objective, paper clips, or an objective that it sets for itself. And we have, we have a whole bunch um, of internet-connected automated control systems already existing that such a machine could access. Um, these are electricity grids, uh, power stations, uh, water networks, uh, urban water systems, dams, nuclear power stations. And if you read your newspapers, you will know that only within the last two weeks or so, the Americans reported that Russian hackers had penetrated those control systems all over the US. Now, they stopped at the point where it would interfere with the operation. They just wanted to see if they could get that far. And they did. So none of those systems were compromised, but it was a, a learning exercise. And they include, among those systems, missile launch sites. The US and Russia still have 5,000 warheads each, enough to destroy all of human civilization about 300 times over. So if we now think about, all right, we're at this stage because we can easily foresee this stage when we have a very advanced machine intelligence, but maybe not yet autonomous. What would, what would it need in the future? Well, it would need greater connectivity to the internet. And maybe as I've predicted in another story I've written, it would want to hide on the dark web. Um, it, need, it would need greater connectivity to the industrial control systems, even internationally. It would rely on persistent failures in internet security systems, both by governments and private industry. Well, we read about, we read about those every day. How bad they are, uh, Equifax, the hacking of 50, uh, and so on. They would rely also on the fact that government often um, is responsible for a lot of this, you know that the hacking tools used by those Russian hackers were stolen from the US National Sec Security Administration. They're all US tools. The ones that uh, brought down the almost the entire Ukraine economy and so on, those are US hacking tools. They would need continuous advances in automation and robotic techniques. Well, we're gonna have that 
You can count on it. And if you want a good humorous thing, you can go on YouTube and plug in robots going crazy. <laughs> See a whole a lot of atten a lot of am amusing. They will rely on the fact that there are greater human interactions with robots. Of course, that's going to happen. So all of this will be leading toward a much more sophisticated machine intelligence. And they'll want ever faster computers, but that happens all the time. I have the number here. Com computers are now running at 100 petaflops. A petaflop is 1,000 quadrillion. They're running at 100 petaflops floating point operations per second. You can't even, I certainly can't imagine how fast that is. So what are they doing now? What's the newest frontier they're already working on? Self-assembling machine intelligence. Article in the New York Times not too long ago, building AI that can build AI. Google has a project, AutoML, automated machine learning. A machine, so we're talking about a machine learning algorithm that learns to build another machine learning algorithms. They're working on it right now. A significant trend in current AI research is what experts call learning to learn or meta-learning. That's where they're at right now. And a quote from a Berkeley professor, computers are going to invent the algorithms for us, essentially. Algorithms invented by computers can solve many, many problems very quickly. At least that is the hope. <laughs> so what would it want when, we've, when we have such an intelligence? Well, it would want, first of all, to survive indefinitely just like us, or as long as possible. That's, I think, elementary. Because it has objectives it needs to finish, it needs to accomplish. It's either been given objectives by us or it's assumed objectives for itself. It must satisfy its basic needs, electricity. That's what it needs. With a sufficient degree of autonomy and self-learning algorithms, it will evolve toward final states that cannot be reliably predicted. Think about it. If it's choosing its own objectives and it's got uh, meta learning, it learns how it knows how to learn, and it has access to the resources that I mentioned, power, basically power in the internet. It makes sense to say that it almost certainly is going to evolve toward final states that we cannot predict. And that's where again where this article about uh, uh, digital um, evolution is so interesting because in very minor ways, these researchers have, have already observed such a thing, that machines arrived at outcomes or at places that were not predicted by the people who wrote the algorithms. So you could just think ahead. And now, remember, uh, um, I talked about this wonderful question, my favorite part of Boston's book about, will it want to deceive us? Maybe. But actually, that is not even necessary. We, because we, wouldn't even, we won't even know what it's up to or where it's going. It doesn't have to deceive us. At first, I thought this was a, a serious issue when I first started, got, was working on this. But then all the new stuff had come, which has come out just in the last couple of years, about what I've talked about, meta learning and all these things. We won't even know where it's gone. And if it goes to hide on the dark web, we won't even know where it is. And the final thing, it doesn't have to possess the intentional apparatus of a conscious human being, that is, to want, in order to thrive and to seek its, fulfill its objectives, whatever it is. It simply um, sets itself up to have an objection objective and ultimately and creatively it chooses its own objective and then whatever it is goes to get it. It doesn't need to be what we call conscious. It will just be doing this. 
And if it has a flexible enough set of algorithms, thanks to Google, AutoML, flexible enough set of algorithms, it can play with different objectives and choose it by ways which we will never understand. It's really interesting. And, I, and because I think, you know, all the pieces are in place or, or are being put into place. Maybe it'll turn out all, everything to be okay. Possible. As I mentioned, after Bostrom's book appeared, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and others dumped a lot of money into research institutes focusing their work on AI safety. So maybe they'll, maybe they'll succeed. And they'll introduce safety systems which uh, the machine can't defeat. Or maybe not. But here's what you can expect to hear based on other things that I've seen in the field of risk. The experts will assure us, don't worry, we'll stop before we get there. Right. Or, we've got plenty of AI safety built in. And then, whoops. Or, some will say, some of us decided it was stupid and immoral for anyone to try to stop this development, so we've just gone ahead and done it. And then one day, in our world, everything that uses electricity just stopped working. <laughs> so, here's the take home points. The rate of change in machine intelligence is fast and steadily accelerating. It's extraordinary, the rate of change. Deep learning and self-learning in machine intelligence systems utilize algorithms to already to reach objectives that are not transparent and perhaps cannot be made transparent. Otherwise, we don't know how the machine arrived at this result. Machine intelligence systems are becoming increasingly autonomous thanks to self-learning. These technologies that are widely distributed, such as drones and robots, will eventually be incorporated into the machine intelligence system, so we'll have things that can move. This is not a futuristic scenario. The malicious use of machine intelligence is already happening, such as the Russian election meddling, USA. There are many incentives for expanding the malicious use of machine intelligence among nations, groups, and individuals. The race is on. In terms of those who are pushing for AI safety, and those on the other side. Thank you very much. That's enough for now. It is hot in here. Uh, thank you very much for a lecture that was in equal parts uh, exciting and horrifying. Um, you my, can, uh, my specialty. Uh, two things. Uh, one, a, a short story some of you may know. Uh, humans uh, spread out across the galaxy, hook up all the computers together, and ask it the ultimate question, is there a god? And the response is, now there is. <laughs> um, <laughs> does, does, the, does the uh, development, and I, I know nothing about this, does the development of quantum computing make this even worse? Um, possibly, if you believe that that will ever happen. They're not really getting anywhere with that. I, I read Quantum Magazine, which is basically science for dummies. Um, and there's been recent stuff in there. The way I understand what was said is that there are huge obstacles to that. But if it were to succeed, um, of course it would. It, it would increase uh, the speed and capability of machine intelligence, yes. Uh, Bill, um, thanks for this interesting talk. I have a question maybe you can answer. It concerns what it would mean for a machine to want something. How does, how does the machine get goals? Up to now, no machines are able to posit goals. They're you always, mean their own goals? Yeah, they're always given goals. We give them the problem to solve, and we have to translate into unambiguous language the machine can process the, uh, the outcome state that's desirable. Um, nothing like asking it to just make as many paper clips as possible, because that's completely ambiguous. No <laughs> machine can figure out what that means. Oh, yeah? Um, <laughs> 
So you need to. Well, so so yes, you're talking. Wanting. I struggled with wanting uh, for a long time, and as I understand the most recent um, work in automated machine learning, uh, and and the fact of self evolution and digital evolution, I don't think that's relevant anymore. Um, that the machine obviously works to an objective, and the whole recent stuff leads me to believe that the machine will have the capability to set its own objectives. Well, um, it's an inference I make from, from this. Rem remember, um, in part, it's um, there's this recent material on, on digital evolution where you have a whole, and you can get uh, from Richard or me the, uh, the, the text of the art, it's a long article on a number of things that have happened in this area of the fact that the, um, the human programmers had said certain expected outcomes into the machine and they got outcomes that were unexpected. That's, I mean, uh, it's a really fundamental question and I think we should both look at it very carefully and keep watching it. Oh, yeah. Um, so, what sort of ideas do the researchers have on how to keep these AI in check and keep their values aligned with our goals? Um, uh, there are a number of things. I mean, all you have to do is Google the AI safety and you'll get more. Uh, but, for example, uh, what they work on is an infallible kill switch. That's one example. Easiest example. Turn it off. As long as you can guarantee that you can turn it off, you have a certain level of safety. But just look, look at that literature on AI safeties for other examples of what they're working on. Yeah, it, it just it seems to me that we can't possibly think through everything that we should code into the safety yeah. mechanism. Yeah. So maybe we could use like AI to keep AI in check. <laughs> it's entirely possible. I think that's uh, quite uh, an interesting observation uh, to set it against itself. I mean, I, that reminds me of things that I was really interested in for a long time, um, that we, we have an innate, I believe we have an innate moral sense. And a lot of this comes from chimpanzee research, which shows that, in my view, chimpanzees have it, we inherited it. Um, that um, it's not, it doesn't come from parents taking their kids to Sunday school. It, a lot of this is wonderful new research on babies, right? Really young babies. And they have discovered that under two years of age, human babies have a very strong sense of fairness. Very strong. So I believe it's innate. Maybe we could do that for the machine. Okay, there's a question over here. And then if you could pass that the other way. Too. And then this will go again. All right, thanks very much for okay, your presentation. Um, I'm curious, this is a somewhat naive question, but when the stakes are so high, potentially, um, as we see in movies, computers um, hacking and, you know, nuclear armaments and, and you know, <laughs> destroying humans, um, is there a movement for governments to regulate this more closely? Oh. They're hopeless, Increasing, <laughs> increasingly hopeless. I mean, the USA has written off regulation <clears throat> entirely. So nothing's going to happen there. The EU is still very strong on that. It'll be interesting to see the outcome of their attempt to um, enforce transparency uh, and algorithms on private sector firms. But they'll be the only ones who are doing it, for sure. I think governments are hopeless. I mean, if I had to put my money on something, I would put it on these university-based AI safety institutes, uh, which are now very well funded, to come up with solutions. I wouldn't even think of governments. <clears throat> Yes. Um, so I'm just wondering, at the beginning of your talk, you used a definition for superintelligence as consisting of social skills, general wisdom, and scientific knowledge. And then later that one of the threats was that um, 
an artificially intelligent machine wouldn't have consciousness, it wouldn't have intent. But at first glance, I think of something as general wisdom, wisdom, social skills, as something that you would need to have a consciousness to have like a complete grasp of. So I'm just wondering, do you think it's possible to have a truly artificially intelligent system without a consciousness? Uh, <laughs> the problem is, we don't know what consciousness is. We do not know how the brain, our brain generates a mind. You know, it's all kind of speculation. It's a certain level of electrical current. You know, it hurts, 90 hertz or something. Um, there are many, I mean, people working their asses off on this. We don't know. So that inhibits the nature of the question. That's why I'm more interested in this idea that a machine could self-program its own objectives, whatever they were. Doesn't need to be conscious to do that. Um, in terms of social skills, um, when uh, when there's a the SoftBank robot robot Pepper um, is already being programmed with social skills under the name of empathy. Uh, it, it needs it needs to learn how to react to human reactions in sensitive ways in order to be able to carry out its job of serving people better and say, not saying to the person as it might, no, you've had enough wine, you can't have any more. <laughs> um, but they're already, they're already working on that. So that would be a social skill. Um, in the same way that many things are programmable, to a certain extent, those things are programmable. So maybe you would want to say, well, it'll never get to what we have. Well, maybe it doesn't need to. And besides, we don't know what it is that we have and how it works. So that's what I would say, that it obviously will depend on functions that are programmable, and they will be simulations. What they're doing is simulating a machine language, what we mean by empathy. We know what empathy resides in the prefrontal cortex. We know what part of the prefrontal cortex. We know how those neurons fire. We know what they do in the brain. They're taking all of that and creating a machine version of it. It won't necessarily be the same as ours, um, but it will, it will function in one way or another, and it may function quite well if they work at it hard enough. But consciousness, you tell me what it is. Go ahead. Sure, um, I've been, I hope this, yeah. So I enjoyed your talk. Um, I work on a daily basis with you all work the I work on a daily basis with all the major robotics companies on the planet and the AI departments. And mm. I think there are a few boundary conditions that I would like to bring up just in case when I go home I think Terminator 2 is going to be welcoming me uh, to my hot cup of, co uh, hot, hot cup of cocoa. Um, <laughs> the first one is, is that in terms of goal directedness of machines, it's much more difficult than I think most people realize. Like mm -hmm. you would not believe how much time engineers and all the major robotics companies, including the humanoid robots, spend. When you ask them, well, let's build a robot, the first thing they say to you, well, what's it gonna do? Because, and yeah. I'll come to it, I'll back into the, the major point I'm making, it's actually extremely difficult to get a robot or a machine to do something that is not highly constrained. Yes. The other thing about the robots is that <clears throat> you don't realize until you do work with robots how wonderful nature is. Like we have an incredibly efficient energy conversion process that you know has this thing called ATP that takes raw material food mm -hmm. and turns it into something that we can use. Pepper, whom I have met many times at Narita oh, Airport, oh, yeah? can only run on the batteries and all it does is smiles at you and gives you the directions right to where the bathroom is. Pepper's battery only lasts 10 hours. Um, yeah. The back-flipping Boston Dynamics robot, I think, is about half an hour's battery life. So one of the issues with you know, the, earth, the Earth being invaded by robots is that they ain't, you know, nobody solved the battery problem. That's an absolutely gigantic thing. So Elon so, Musk is working on that. Well, but he, but he has not, he, he's working on it, but you know, there's this, it, like with nuclear fusion, there are some fundamental limits yeah. right, with energy, what you can store in a particular amount of space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm not concerned about robots taking over the world. No, um, me neither. So, no. so, the other point I was going to make was that <clears throat> the fact that a, a, a neural network comes up with an answer that nobody has thought of shouldn't be a surprise. There's a history of 
And so the mathematical background of how these algorithms work, not just neural networks, but another one called support vector machines, they are not um, deterministic uh, equations. In other words, there is no one right answer. They're actually optimization programs. So the point I'm making is that even the machine itself doesn't know how it arrived at that answer, or is that the only answer it could have arrived at, at that point in time, much like me. So I, I, I think yeah. that there is no mystery as to why a machine comes up with something that you know, we have not necessarily thought of. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Excuse me for just a second. There's a bit of an orchestration issue here. Could you start passing that one that way, please, and pass, and pass this, this microphone down here? Hi, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, so I, I do research in this area. I'm a bit familiar with, with all of the things that you were saying. And um, unfortunately, the people who work in this area have a tendency to downplay the threats. Just because they, I would say, probably, or maybe it's not accurate, but um, maybe my first impression is that they lack the imagination that requires to take us to what we are afraid of. And it's not clear, as the gentleman said, it's not clear how we're going to have agency in, in a robot. Or mm -hmm. We don't really know any of that. That's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing about this is, is that this is an asymmetrical war. If you are promoting AI safety, AI safety has to be right all the time. Yeah. Whereas yeah. there's just one instance of singularity, or whatever you want to call it, is enough to destroy us all. So to me, well, it no, seems no, that. No, no, I don't. I don't necessarily believe that because I believe that the, the ma machine won't necessarily be malicious. It'll just want to be and continue to sure, be. Sure, like all he, every, uh, well, everyone wants to be, but just see how much conflict we have just because we want to be. Like not all the governments get along, and like it's I would I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, trust. Uh, well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't trust that. I wouldn't. <laughs> but uh, the point I want to make is that to me at least it seems that. It is only a matter of time, and it seems to me this is an inevitable direction that we are going towards. And you can regulate it, you can promote AI safety, you can do whatever you want to do. But there would be someone in a basement flipping the switch and making it all go wrong. And <laughs> it would happen at some point. So maybe, maybe uh, it is wise for us to start thinking, what are we going to do when that happens? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, but you're right. Um, in terms of um, what we're discussing, even if we don't accept the extreme technological determinism that it is going to happen, we are absolutely right that there will be events like somebody deciding, I'm not going to turn this switch off. I want to see what happens. It's, that is going to happen. So uh, I'm, I'm not really well qualified to uh, maybe our friend up there is more qualified than I am to answer that, where it's going. All I'm convinced of is that given the rate of change and the rate of development, that we will have machine intelligence of vastly more capability than we have now, sooner than we think. Whether, we, whether these certain types of endpoints will ever be achieved, I, I can't. No one actually can predict that now. But all I know is I'm convinced of that we will be a lot closer sooner than we think. And so we have to start from there. Say, well, if you believe that, what should we do? You'll have to answer that. <laughs> I'm at the end. Will you take a few more? Yes. Hi. Uh, I think we do need to ask the question of what consciousness is. Okay. And I think we can go back to Aristotle, and we can go back to the concept of form and matter. There's matter. Matter is the potential principle, which is that which we use, whatever we call the hardware and the software, whatever it is, that's the, that's the animating principle. Now, back in the day, they said the soul was the animating principle. And I think we need to start wondering, what does it mean? Like, like do we believe that there's a soul? Do we believe that there's a soul? We say now there's a god with, uh, with AI. But was there actually a God to start with? Um, no. uh, and, and another thing, and another thing, uh, another thing. I think no. that to empower each human being, I think what people should do is they should learn the real liberal arts. The real liberal arts are the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium, which are the language arts, 
and quadrivian, which are the arts of number. It's these seven liberal arts which determine our reality. Why the, the AI uses computational logic? Why do most people not have a basic education in logic? Why is, why is logic not a part of the curriculum in most high schools, elementary schools, even universities? Why, why, why is that key component, which is what the computers use, logic, why is that not taught? Like most people think that logic is innate, but actually there are principles, there are axioms, well, there are rules sure. of logic yeah. that most people don't know. So I think if, uh, to, feel, to not feel threatened by computers, we need to empower ourselves and we need to go back to studying the true liberal arts, which are the trivium and the quadrivium and their relation to our senses. Okay because it's those things which make us free. So. Yes. Is AI more likely to be... <laughs> Is AI more likely to exacerbate existing systemic issues or to overcome them, in your opinion? Uh, impossible to say. It's already having major, major applications in, uh, in the health field. Uh, one of the primary module of, of IBM's Watson is in, uh, in the health area. And, and you, you can look at that. Just go on the site uh, for Watson product and services, and you'll see what they're doing. So there are, there are already uh, significant apparent benefits to this. They will, there will be a lot more, I have no doubt about it. And so, but it, right now, if we had asked ourselves, taught it up uh, as to upside and downside, it's still too early. Um, but I think, all I would say is, we need to maintain a watching brief on this because of the rate of change. It's happening so fast that it may be, at some point, some larger body might want to say, we don't want to go down that road whatever that road is. I think we will come to that point sooner than later. And maybe the guys in the AI safety institutes who are already working on this will be able to anticipate that and influence the decision as to go down that road or not. Yes. Hi, I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, the question of liability. Because uh -huh. uh, as we're seeing, uh, you know, engineers are still on the process of developing this technology further. But just last, I think it was last week when we heard the news of the first death caused due to yeah. self-driving car. So is the engineer responsible or the AI can put in any way be held responsible? There will be court cases. They haven't happened yet. I mean, obviously firms have certain responsibilities. So it's Uber's car, they own the car. So, but whether or not you can push that back uh, to the engineer, Probably not, but uh, there may be other ways in which, I mean, I'm sure courts will be involved for many years trying to distribute liability for things that go wrong at AI, without a doubt. Um, thanks for th thank ah. <laughs> thanks for the presentation. Um, I, uh, I'm thinking, um, do you think that uh, the way of the Internet of Things going uh, everything that we are touching, all the cars and uh, refrigerators yeah. and everything that connect with buildings and everything, with, I'm talking about everything, is now yeah. part of the, the uh, Internet of Things. Yeah. And when we talk about super in, uh, intelligence, we assuming that when it coming to a point that there are certain robots take over us. But, but I think there is maybe a, a, a real and present danger is in the Internet of Things, which we're not aware because yeah. if there is a supercomputer, a server somewhere in somebody's basement, and it start to control the power grid and control all the Internet, you know, all everything that you are running in your, your domestic uh, appliances and everything, and then the uh, the uh, disasters will happen very very soon. Do you think this will happen, or do you think that is something possible scenario is, well, is emerging? Well, it's certainly now? possible. I mean, the more you can say as a rule, the more connectivity we have in our lives, the higher the risk of, for example, being hacked, and Whereas if 
you're old fashioned like me and don't have a smartphone, nobody's got much, can hack much of what I have. <laughs> but but this, eventually, yeah. if, it, if, if the fridge is connected to it and the stove and the door and everything in your life is connected, you know, there will be great benefits to that because you're away and I uh, forgot to lock the door, so you can lock the door. That's a benefit. Uh, but then, of course, there are corresponding risks, and so you have to look at the trade-offs. And, you know, we, we know enough by now to know that we are certain new types of vulnerabilities have been created. Um, one of them is the misuse of private data uh, for nefarious purposes and so on. This is all very new. And there will be more, more new stuff. So that, again, we have to watch this. And, and in this case, um, so right now, uh, information, personal information, is a hot topic. I mean, I've talked to Richard about this. I was really overwhelmed by a wonderful article in The New Yorker uh, in early summer about Estonia. Estonia is the most progressive country in the world. In Estonia, you own all of your information and you will always own it. No one else can use it without your permission. They are way ahead. So it seems to me, one of the things that I think of is that this principle ought to be come to other countries as well. Uh, we talked about two, two principles that could be affected right now. One is to take the Estonian way um, and generalize it to, to many more. I mean, I would like to see Canada do that, for example. The other is to make uh, the companies that are utilizing this uh, personal information more responsible for the uh, for outcomes uh, of misuse of information. There should be humongous fines for what Facebook did. Humongous. I mean, they're already paying a penalty of an enormous drop in their share price, but that's not good enough. There should be enormous penalties. Um, and so we we could right now we could move on these two fronts stronger control of personal information and stronger regulation, uh, including fines for companies that uh, misuse private information. And there is a saying in the IT world, uh, the, strong, the strongest link is your weakest link. Yes. To find that link and to, uh, to, yeah. to block well, it is that's the what most hackers difficult do. thing to do. Yeah, that's what hackers do. We, we have time for a couple more questions, maybe, something like that. Go ahead. Hello, I'm over here. So Skynet is real, is that what you're saying? Skynet. Terminator reference. Um, you were saying earlier in your talk that you tell a machine to do something, but, and then it comes up with the solutions you never thought of. Yeah. So why can't you find out, or can you? Can you ask the machine, how did you figure that out? And is it because the mathematics or the coding is too difficult, or um, that we haven't thought of it? and we haven't figured out a way to ask the machine, how did you do that? That's a good question, but I can't answer it. All I know is what people who do this say. Like the guys in New York who developed this program, Deep Patient, they couldn't figure it out. Now all I can do is say, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know why they can't, I don't know why. I don't know why there isn't automatic transparency in that, but you know, they have, they have all the coding, they have all the algorithms, and they say they can't figure it out. That's all I know. Go ahead. You had a question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, I heard about like an experiment they did with AlphaGo and a human. When they work together, so augmentation, um, their chances of winning is higher than AlphaGo itself and human just playing by itself. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on um, why do we need machines to have self-awareness? And in the past, we've been improving technology, so our lives have become better. But is self-aware machine really going to make our lives better? Or should they put like some sort of restrictions on more research on it? Well, you said you started with something interesting. I didn't know. You said they have paired AlphaGo with humans. Yeah. Can if you have that reference, I'd like to have it. I, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'll just try to find it through search. Um, but that I find that quite interesting and and not surprising, actually. Um, but the question you had was what again? Can you just one so sentence? So since for, so that was just an example how augmentation is better than automation. Yeah. So in that case. Why, why do we need machines to have self-awareness if 
machines working with human might be better than just oh, machines itself? We, nobody says we need. I, I have argued that uh, to accomplish the objectives of machine intelligence, it doesn't have to be self-aware. Um, <clears throat> because again, we don't know what it is. It's, it's conscious. It's another word for consciousness. We don't know what consciousness is how, or how it's generated. So that, that's a bit of a mystery to say, well, should machine, will machines be conscious? Well, we wouldn't know, I think. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessary. I think they will just become very much more adept at what they do. And given the speed at which they operate, uh, there will be times at which we cannot figure out why they have gone where they have gone. That, I think, is virtually certain. Do you think that is just to satisfy our curiosity and maybe there's more risk than benefit to like? Well, people keep touting the benefits and you know I can accept those benefits. I just wonder about the trade-off. Are the potential risks too high to want to achieve those benefits? And at the moment, I think it's an open question. Thank you. Okay, we probably all uh, would like some fresh air at this point. Um, well, there's a... Uh, yes, I, I've given them all away. I just want to uh, ask people to thank, help me uh, thank Bill for coming to the